If you want to structure your project according to the clean architecture, but you don't know where to start or how to scale your project structure as the codebase grows, then keep watching, because in this video we will develop a template you can use for every project of any size. Let's get started. Imagine we want to develop a web application for visualizing the backlog of an Agile software project. We need a list of ranked work items with some cut lines for multiple teams, and later we probably want to show some burn down and other metrics like work in progress statistics. And we probably also need some governance regarding the backlog conventions. In the context of this tutorial, we will call this project Athena. So where do we start? I like to start bottom up, or better, inside out. So I would always start with the inner circles. So should we start then with the entities or with the use cases? Well, it depends. If the domain model is pretty clear already, we can start with the entities right away. But in my experience, this is rarely the case. In Agile projects, we mostly work bottom up. So I would usually recommend to start with one specific use case and factor out the entities later on. So we could start by adding a project called Athena Use Cases. But I also like to follow another concept Uncle Bob mentioned in his book called Screaming Architecture, which is about exposing the purpose of the application and not the used details of frameworks at the top level of the project structure. And I also like to build vertical slices right from the beginning, which means the code should be organized at the top level by features and should not artificially separate it, for example, in different architectural layers. So to start our project structure, we pick the most important feature and name the first assembly accordingly. In this project, it would be the backlog handling, so we rename athena.usecases to athena.backlog. We could again add some suffix like .usecases or .core to indicate that this is the center of the feature, only containing business logic, but I usually find that not very informative. It would also cause that non-business logic code immediately requires its own assembly, which I do not want to decide at that point. So let's skip any suffix and instead create a folder use cases. This is helpful because if we later want to split the assembly further, the namespace would already fit and we only need to move files to other folders, which can be done without much effort. We can now create our first interactor, the backlog interactor. We also create a dedicated backlog request model and a backlog response model. The work items shown in this backlog we will only sketch here, so we will only provide an ID, a title and an assigned to. The response model will also contain further information like the total effort and the total capacity. The request model for now will only contain the team, for which the backlog should be calculated. And also the team we will only sketch here by providing a name, an area path and a list of members. To simulate the creation of the backlog response model, we also need an interface for the repository from where we can fetch the work items. With this, we have a very basic sketch of our first interactor. As we do not focus on the detailed design in this video, I have skipped the interfaces for the input and the output port. The team type is very likely part of the domain model and would be relevant for other use cases like the burndown as well. So we may decide to create this as an entity right away and move it to some dedicated place. In case of doubt, I would usually recommend to keep such types local to the feature until we have developed the second feature and we can clearly see what data and which logic is actually needed for both features and factor out entities then. So for now we keep it local to the backlog feature and see how the code base grows and then decide. We have finished the skeleton of our first feature, so let's add it to the version control system. Yes, we don't have any tests yet, but we also don't have any logic to test. So it's fine to submit it. So how do we continue from here? 
We could now take one of the following directions. We could bring up a skeleton for the whole web application. We could add an ASP.NET host, the controllers, and even a basic UI to have a full vertical slice from customer perspective so that we can demo something in the end of the running sprint. Alternatively, we could turn towards test-driven development and set up our first tests in the next step and then let the tests drive the further implementation and also the design. Even so I see much value in the first approach, I strongly recommend to follow the second one for any new feature or functionality, because it not only ensures quality of the feature we present to our customers in the next demo, but also ensures that the design remains testable right from the beginning. So let's continue with a test assembly and add the web container in some later step. I actually like to name my test assemblies .specs. Why? Because I don't like to repeat myself by writing a specification describing how the system should behave and then writing a test proving that the system behaves according to the spec. Instead, I like to write my tests as an executable specification so that the tests do not only verify that the system behaves as expected, but that the tests also document how the system should behave. This concept is usually called specification by example or behavioral driven development. It may happen that we also want to add some technical tests which are not primarily driven by requirements, like some tests for database serialization or a smoke test just checking for exceptions when calling any of the controller APIs through the web client. For such tests I would create a dedicated assembly, which I then would really call tests. I would usually only create such an assembly when really needed, but let's create it right now to draw the full picture. Writing the first test case drives the next decision. In clean architecture, we do not want to expose any internals to the tests. We do not want to expose internal APIs and also no design choices. We actually want to decouple the structure of our application from the structure of our tests. Anyhow, our tests would rather be structured along the features and the scenarios. So we will create a test API, which acts as an anti-corruption layer between the tests and the subject under test, so that both can evolve individually. But where do we place that test API? Uncle Bob writes, this API will be a superset of the suite of interactors and interface adapters that are used by the user interface. But we don't have any adapters yet. So let's create one along with the test API. Let's add a folder called adapters and a controller as interface adapter towards the UI. The controller will basically just do data conversion. It converts data most convenient for the outer layers to data structures most convenient for the inner layers and vice versa. The separation of a controller and the presenter is a topic for another video, so let's skip that here. We also add a dedicated backlog view model as a response object, which will mostly contain strings so that all the formatting, even of doubles, is already done in the backend. Notice that this controller does not depend on ASP.NET Web Framework. As it is part of the adapters layer, such a dependency would violate the dependency rule of the clean architecture. We reached another step in this tutorial, so let's check in what we have created so far. Now let's create a folder called Test API and a class called Test API as well. We will certainly rename that class as the design of the Test API grows. This Test API class hides the concrete implementation details of the controller and also takes care of setting up the fake implementations we need for the tests. It will provide a convenient API for all the tests to just get a rendered backlog. As already said, the Test API should not expose any internals. But as the view model is just a data transfer object designed to expose data to the outer world, which is the UI, I'm fine exposing it to the tests as well. And now with the test service in place, we can write our first test case. For the sake of time, we will not implement it here, but just show how it will interact with the test API. Now that we have tests to document how each feature should work, 
And also to prove that it works as expected, we can move on building the web host or web container around the actual application, so that we can also demo something to our product owner to collect feedback quickly. For the web host, we will certainly create a new assembly to have a strong border between our application code and the ASP.NET framework. This assembly will also host the main component where we will compose the entire application. But how do we connect the web application and the ASP.NET framework to the existing controller? In ASP.NET, we need a controller class deriving from some ASP.NET base class, which then connects to the existing controller. But where to put this? Clearly, this controller would belong to the backlog feature, but it has dependencies to the ASP.NET framework, which means we would violate the dependency rule if we would put it into the existing backlog assembly. Should we create a new assembly in the backlog feature just for that one class? That seems to be overkill. So let's add a controllers folder to the Athena web project and add the controller there for now. This controller will have basically no code intentionally. We want to have as less code as possible in this most outer layer. So it just forwards every call to our actual controller from the adapters layer. The final missing piece is the main component where everything is wired up finally. In ASP.NET, this is usually the startup CS or the program CS. Here we would register services like repositories, controllers, and also our use case interactors. As we do not have a real implementation for the work item repository yet, we simply create a fake implementation. Now let's start our application and see whether the backend API works. It works. So let's check it in. To complete the picture, let's also add a front-end project. I like to keep the UI as thin as possible, so that it actually does not become relevant to the architecture. Therefore, I usually host it within the backend web host inside a web UI folder. Building a modular UI is certainly a topic of its own, so for this tutorial we will keep all the views of all the features in one front-end application. But also in the front-end project we will follow the concepts of the screaming architecture. So we will structure the top level folders according to the features and not according to architectural layers like views and models. In order to make this tutorial not longer than needed, we skip the implementation of the frontend. Nevertheless, let's commit the changes. Now we have a minimal but complete project structure in place which follows the clean architecture. Let's assume we add more functionality to the backlog feature like backlog across all teams versus backlog per team, sprint backlogs, monthly or quarterly backlogs, and more. So we will add more interactors and also more controllers to the adapter layer. And this might be the point where we could ask, should we actually have use cases and adapters split it into separate assemblies? According to the clean architecture, use cases as well as adapters should be independent from any details like external dependencies. Why would we want to have separate assemblies then? The size of an assembly is usually not the driver, at least not for an application code, which is anyhow deployed all at once. One driver will be the governance of architectural rules. The bigger the code base grows, the more important it becomes to have some automated governance. Otherwise, it gets too easy that simple mistakes break the dependencies, which may cause a ripple effect over time and we end up in a mess. A compiler can provide such governance regarding the internal keyword and cyclic references only if we separate individual components into separate assemblies. So as the code base grows and we want to ensure that dependencies only go according to the dependency rule, we may split one assembly into multiple to make use of the compiler features. Of course, we could also use additional tools where we can model our architectural rules more explicitly. One tool I recently discovered and started using is NSDEPCOP. It allows modeling dependency rules according to the namespaces of types and interfaces. Which tools do you use for architectural governance? Leave a comment below the video. For the purpose of this tutorial, we decide to split the assembly now. We do not split the specs or the tests, as those refer to the entire feature, and 
as discussed earlier, are independent from how the product code is structured anyhow. And when it compiles, let's check it in. And what about the I.O. layer? So far the controller, depending on the ASP.NET framework, we have placed in the web project. But at that point, we may decide that it is better to have even the I.O. layer of a feature closer to the actual feature. It expresses visually more clearly where this code belongs to and which dependencies are valid. And we also don't want to touch the web application when enhancing one particular feature. Once it compiles, let's check it in. This is how the project dependencies now look like. Only the adapters depend on the use cases, the specs and the tests only depend on the adapters, and the web project only depends on the I.O. project, which then depends on the adapter project. If you made it up to this point in this video, please support the channel by leaving a like and consider subscribing. Thanks. Fast forward. The first version of the backlog feature is completed, so let's add another bigger feature, the burndown. We would again starting with one assembly and folders inside for the use cases and the adapters and over time consider splitting it. Now we have to decide. Do we already foresee that we will have more controllers so that it is worth creating the I.O. assembly right away? Or should we again starting small and just adding the controller which depends on the ASP.NET framework to the web project as we did it earlier with the backlog controller? For this tutorial, let's assume there will be more controllers for different purposes, so let's create this I.O. assembly right away. And we would apply the same approach to further features like the backlog governance. And of course, we would also add specs to these features as well in the form of test cases. And this will finally bring us to the following project and dependency structure. We see that all dependencies follow the dependency rule of the clean architecture, and we also see that the different features like backlog, burndown and governance are independent from each other. Now that we have so many assemblies on the top level of the solution, it's time to further structure the project with folders. Up to this point we ignored one point completely, shared code. We definitely want to keep those bigger features like backlog, burndown and governance separate because those have independent logic and can evolve independently over time. But certainly there will be shared code. The first obvious shared code is the domain model. Those entities which model the data types and business rules which are common across the features and those rules should be shared to ensure consistent behavior in all features with respect to those rules. For the shared code we will create a new folder called foundation and we will create a project called athena.entities, which will host a domain model. But usually there is more shared code, which should be allowed to be used anywhere. For example, the contract class we have developed in one of the previous videos, to easily apply the design tactic, design by contract. And you probably want to have your own logger interface to allow logging everywhere without creating dependencies to some concrete logging library. So we will create one more project called athena.core, containing such low-level, technical shared code. As we would allow dependencies to this project from any other project, even the entities, the domain model, it's clear that this library can only contain code which has no external dependencies, otherwise we would violate the dependency rule. And what about shared code in the adapters? We may need some shared code in the controllers to parse some data, or also to format some data for the view model. So let's add another project, athena.adapters. And what about shared code in the I.O. layer? What kind of code would we share across the components in the I.O. layer? Right now we have only ASP.NET controllers in our I.O. projects and as there is intentionally almost no code, there shouldn't be much need to share any code. But if we would consider other I.O. code, code talking to external services or doing other kind of I.O., for example exporting a backlog to Microsoft Excel or rendering a burn down to a bitmap, or just fetching the work items from Azure DevOps. Such code might be needed by multiple features. We could now create another project, athena.io, and use folders inside to structure the different shared components, but because those components would very likely have very different responsibilities and very different dependencies, I rather prefer creating dedicated assemblies for each of those components. So for example, athena.export, athena.azuredevops, and so on and so forth. 
And the dependency structure within the project would now roughly look like this. Now starts getting too complicated to really show all the valid dependencies. At this point, we have a scalable template for building web applications following the clean architecture. But what about other types of projects, like command line tools, for example? Well, we would basically follow the same approach. The only thing what we have to replace is the IO layer. So instead of the athena.web project, we would certainly have an athena.cli. And we would probably also replace the different IO projects with some implementations which are parsing command line arguments and some presenters which probably render the backlog and the burn down either to the console or to some bitmap or some other file formats. We will skip this exercise for now because this tutorial already got quite long. We made it. Now we have a receipt for setting up the next clean architecture project and also for adapting the structure as the code base grows. The code used in this tutorial is available on GitHub. The link to the repository you can find in the description below the video. So feel free to use it as a copy and paste template for your next project. So this is how I would start and grow a clean architecture project. I like to go bottom up and grow things incrementally. Nevertheless, due to my experience in bigger software projects with multiple millions of lines of code, I like to create more strict boundaries between the different features and components using more assemblies. This can certainly be handled more pragmatically in smaller projects. The important aspects to keep in mind are keep the business logic strictly independent from the details, have a test API, and always follow the dependency rule. Are you interested in more thoughts on clean architecture and software design in general? Then watch the next video from this playlist now.